Families are complicated, and speaking as an only child, I cannot imagine what it would be like to have siblings. Never mind having two younger brothers, who are two of the most iconic names, faces, and voices of the last 25 years. Liam and Noel may be the headline makers, but working away behind the scenes, travelling the world and spinning tunes is their eldest brother. This is Paul Gallagher. As an Irish man, right, this is something that really annoys me, and I'm not a big card-carrying Republican or anything like that, but... Gallagher or Gallagher? Gallagher. So you do have a preference then. Does it bother you when you hear like, oh, Liam Gallagher, Paul Gallagher, Noel Gallagher? It, it depends who's saying it. If it's in England, then that's what they say. Um, if it's in Ireland and they say that, I'm like, it's Gallagher. I think the only one ever got it right on the radio was um, Nicky Campbell, Radio 5 Live, on St. Saint, Saint Patrick's Day morning. He goes, welcome, Paul Gallagher. I went, fucking hell, you got it right. <laughs> it's one of those things that I do notice myself. It's always in the UK that they say it. And it kind of surprises me because the two lads have kind of made the name so synonymous it's, and so famous it's a, it's with Ireland. Gallic, Gallic, Gallic. They don't understand that. <laughs> I know this is a really kind of strange question to ask because I'm an only child myself. So if somebody said to me, oh, how do you think your life would be different if you had brothers? But if Peggy and your dad had stopped after one kid, how yeah. different do you think your life would be? What do you think you'd be doing? Uh, no idea. I'd probably be... Fuck, I don't know where it'd be. Good question. No idea. Do you think your life would be less or more complicated? I think it'd be less complicated. I'd have less hassle. I think I'd be away in a library somewhere. Don't know. A prison been... library? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think I would have been in prison. I think I would have been a bookkeeper or something nerdish. One thing that I'm sure must get on your tits after all these years, and I even experience it myself, I have a mate, right, who yeah. has a brother. And the brother's done really well for himself. He's a music agent. He's living the life of a millionaire. He's uh-huh. hanging around with all these celebs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Now, I know the two of them equally. But when I meet the younger one, like, I, I actually care about the younger one. Like, as in, if I haven't seen him in a long time, I'm like, oh, what's the story? I haven't seen you in so long. And it's like that fucking internet meme that I hear in my brain going, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. And it just blurts out, how's your brother? Well, you meet people in the street and they go, you all right? Yeah, right? how's your brother? It's, like, it's less than 40 seconds in. I'm like, which one? And do you notice that? Like, is it a thing that you've just gotten used to over time, or does it still get on your tits a little bit? You're kind of going. Um, well. My mates don't ask me about them, but the people you see in the street. How you going? Not seen you for a long time, actually, brother. Fucking read the newspapers. How do I know? It's probably in the book, but it was 23 years ago since I last read it. Yeah. Where does the bod nickname come from? Well, I was a mod. So it was bod the mod. Yeah, very very strange occurrence in the late 70s. I think there was. Um, between 77 and 81, I'd say there was. In my area growing up, it was like mass warfare. It was like the 50s West Side Story. There was the Teddy Boys. There was the Rockers. There was still the Sweaties from the Glam Lot. There was the Punks. Uh, and then there was the Perry Boys with the Flicks. And then there was the Mods. And you don't have these massive fights. You don't have different discos. And it'd be like, you know. So I was bod the Mod. Bit, bit odd. Odd bod, I think they call me. And was it only just because it rhymed or what? Like, sure. Yeah, because they're all thick, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Bod, one more. I mean, there was a TV cartoon called Bod. Here comes Bod, and he's nothing like me. So yeah, I think Bobby Gillespie tried to call me the other day in Prague. I went, "Oi, you knew, you know me as Paul, not Bod." So I have to pull him up. How's your mum these days? Uh, I think she's okay. I haven't seen her. I got a message off her this morning. Call me. I'm like, what do you want? Your cousins are in Cork. Which ones? <laughs> oh, them. Okay, right. What do you want me to do? Well, they've got their own tickets. Okay, so what? Well, you have to arrange something. Like, Drop no, by what? and have a cup of tea. Kind uh, of thing. Well, no, I've, I found them. I said, listen, ring that number. You get looked after. See you later. I'm sure she's well used to it by now, but what does your mum make of the adulation she gets when she does on the rare occurrence turn up to gigs? I remember going to see BDI in the Olympia. I think it was the first time they played it. And you were there because oh, yeah, you were yeah. playing across the road in the mercantile after. Uh-huh. And I remember like in the, the Olympia has those great boxes at the side of the stage yeah. where everybody's looking to see who's in the fucking things. Yeah, it's like, it's, oh! yeah, it's one of my lifelong ambitions to watch a band that there's, I actually like from those boxes. There's nobody in there. Yeah. But I remember your mum coming in with all your aunties and all that. And I remember the crowd rearing up with the whole Peggy, Peggy yeah. chant. Like, she hasn't, she she can't well she I think she was at the Manchester Arena two years ago um, that's it she doesn't really bother she's 75 she's not she doesn't drink she's never drank she doesn't smoke it's a long time because you have to go you know it's three four hours when you go to one of them marinas it's like going to a football match she's she can't be bothered but I'm sure I watch the, the, TV, the DVD on the television with the DVD player <laughs> I, I sent her the DVD the other day she, uh, she goes I said have you not seen the film she's like no, nobody sent me the DVD. I'll send you the DVD. And then have you seen it yet? No, I'm going to watch it tonight with the cousin Tracy. I'm going to press the DVD and then watch the boys in the TV. 
I was like, okay, whatever. Have is this a, a DVD of the gig or a DVD of as it was, it, the as documentary? It was thing, yeah. Man, she's like the star of the show on that. So many I people. I said, no one's sending a fucking DVD. Do I have to do this all the time? It cost me fortune sending out DVDs. <laughs> I'm like a distribution Pirate. company. It comes across, and I know you've known her all your life because obviously she's your mom, but yeah. like, she's such the quintessential Irish mom. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so she never people. lost the accent because she's got. Um, there was, I think, it was. She's one of eleven, and there's seven of them in Manchester within three streets of each other. Okay. So Burnage is like little Mayo. Burnage is little Sweeneyville. It's little Charlestown. <laughs> it's the capital of Sea Town. Yeah. But there's so many golden quotes from her because there's that one where she says to Liam, "There's no use coming here now when I'm when oh, I'm yeah, gone or when I'm not here." Me, she, she says it to me. She's and, like, uh, my, my, it's all right doing the WhatsApp, but you know you need to come up here because I'm not going to be here forever. I'm like, all right, chill out. <laughs> doing the WhatsApp. Peggy's on the WhatsApp, is she? I got her on the WhatsApp. No, I, I taught her how to do um, email years ago. I says you need to discover email. She goes, I can't do that. I says, yes, you can. This is what this is. This is what it's going to do. I'm going to send you. This is your email address, and I'm going to send you emails. And all you got to do is reply. How, I don't know how to do that. I said, you will. So I was taking screenshots and showing her, this is how you do it. And she went, ah, I got that. I said, cool. Now we're going to progress to text messages. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yes, you do. And we persevered and we got to WhatsApp and picture messages. Yeah, she's good. But she can't send a, a, an email straight. It's got to be a, a replied one. Okay. So okay. She's, she's not got, she can't instigate she, an email. She does more than Liam. He can't do that. For real? I don't think he can send an email. Actually typing in the email address and then doing it. And I think he can, he can as URLG at the he end can, of it. He can, he, can re, he can reply to it. Okay. So they, I didn't teach him. And he can't swim either. No, we don't do swimming. Okay. Ne- you need a submarine here today. It's, it's cork is cork under is weather warfare. Monsoon. But yeah, just getting back to your mom and the dock. Like my favorite thing, and a lot of people have missed it. And I even showed it to my own mother because I was like, "You do this." My favorite scene with your mom. It's a blink and you'll miss a thing. Is when Lean points at the picture of Noel and Sarah on the wall. Oh and yeah. He says. Prince fucking Philip and whatever, and, it was, and you hear your mum in the back going, "Stop it, you! Stop, Stop it. it! It's so, yeah. it's such a quintessential thing. It's amazing. These new thing is Sugar and the cranky, uh, crankies. I think that's what he's up to as well. <laughs> People ask me, go, what's he talking about? I'm not here to translate his thoughts. I'm reading between the lines, and I think he means Sarah. And yeah, he's like, yeah, there's Prince Philip and yeah, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Your mom's house features on one of those Manchester music tours. Does that kind of weird you out or weird her out a little oh, bit? Oh, no, no. Well, that was um, Gilly. God, he's dead now. I committed suicide. Um, Craig Gill from the Spiral Carpet started Manchester music tours. And he, she, my mum used to... Because f- she knew him. She's known him since he was 14. Of course. And that little can- ginger Gilly fella bringing Japanese fellas to the door of my house. <laughs> Have a word with him. And so I says to Gilly, he says, listen, you can't drive to the door. He's like, oh, no, no, no. What? I'm stopping at the top, you know, top of the road. You know, and, uh, so he, he knew. Mm. the boundaries my mum was like don't you be coming to I live here you you little ginger bollocks <laughs> yeah yeah so I mean no she, she, she was alright with Gilly I was surprised when I saw because I remember seeing it online and the article that was about it mentioned the name of the road that you grew up on so I went full stalk and I was like tell me they haven't just given away the address to people you no, know no, we, well we didn't grow up in that house we, oh, yeah, we arrived there when we were kind of adults mm-hmm. we grew up in, in another one but um, I went full stalker because I was going like They've hardly given away Peggy's address in this I mean, everyone kind of knows. I mean, Gilly, God rest his soul, I think his uh, wife took over that business and I think she went out to see my mum, s- sat down for a cup of tea and a chat to chat. So, yeah, so it's, it's also... I Google mapped it. I had a look at your mum's house on Google. And do you know how I found which one it was? Because it had the nicest garden. And I'd seen pictures oh, yeah, of it before. Yeah, she likes, she likes, she likes, she's obsessed with gardening. Would the neighbours be, uh, be jealous? Because Peggy definitely has the nicest garden on the row. Well, um, no, I don't think, it's not that kind of area, is it? When you get to that age, though, your garden is your pride and joy. Do you know what I'm saying? It's well, kind of, it's, it's like a sports garden. car. She's, yeah, she's, she's got, the, i got two gardens. I'm, I'm sick of grass. I want to concrete them. I've seen the backyard in, a, in the documentary when Liam was talking about listening oh, to little, the Beatles yeah, and little, smoking yeah. and all that. That's what, that's perfect. That's the right size. Anything bigger than that. And we've got an acre in Mayo. And I'm like, every time I go there, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with it? Stick a few cows in it. I jump on the ride on, go around a half an hour until it breaks down. And then I get, you broke that ride on again. It's like, I didn't. I fucking rolled around and emptied. It, it, it is a field. It's not a lawn. I'm trying to make them understand. I, I made a tractor, mind. not a mower. I know a geezer has one of them ride on things and he rewards himself by drinking cans as he goes around on it because he lines them up on top of it and drives around on it. That no, makes no, it's, it's, it's not really, it's kind of bumpy, it's not level, it's whatever, it's one of those, mayo, what do you expect? I, along with bog. thousands of others, follow you on Instagram. Is the photography buzz a new thing with you or how um, did that come about? Well, I've always had cameras, but I, I found the DSLRs big and bulky and I, just come, I think I had a Nikon D something or other. 
it was a, it was a smaller version of the Canon and that was all right and then yeah it's just bulky and then I, I discovered the Sony's the Sony a6000 tiny little cameras that do the same I thought this is fantastic and then I went all in Sony it cost me a fortune but you know, it's good that's what I was going to ask you, why Sony? Because they're very much kind of the, the hit makers in the camera world nowadays. Everybody's on Sony. Everyone I follow on Instagram... It that, was just the one that I found first. Really, the A6000 the of was a, t- a tiny one. Then you I have went, an A7 III now, like me, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I got, I got, I got, I got the, the big gear. But, um, what kind of lenses are you rocking with that? Uh, I'm only carrying two to this show. I'm only carrying, G-Masters, I bet. No, G-Masters. They're too expensive. Sony need to come down. The prices are just outrageous. I know they got to compete with Canon, but... Mm. Um, I've got two lenses with me, uh, 70-200 to 200 f4, that's for getting all the people having breakdowns in the crowd with a bit of pyrotechnics <laughs> on the top, and then 18-135, uh, to 135, which is, it's alright, I mean. Are these the Zeiss ones, or are they? No, no, they're just Sony, you can't, um, I think the Because it, it goes, Sony Zeiss is the middle one, I mean, and then Sony G Master is the I think, top I, I think the 70-200 the is a G, ah, listen, a 1400 quid, mate, give a shit, <laughs> it's expensive. Stick it on a two and a half grand. You know, you're talking a lot of money. Eh? And when you were saying you always had cameras, like, are we talking film cameras and stuff that were you oh, documenting yeah, little stuff? Film cameras, yeah. Back in the day, 35 mil. I remember I was, I was with Paul Slattery at the I think 1994 Glastonbury when Oasis did their debut, and um, he was the official photographer. And he he said, I've, I've got a spare camera. Do you want to come in the pit? And I was like, I, was, I think I was wasted at that day. I was like, cool. Well, what do you have to do? <laughs> he goes, just look into it and point it. So I thought, fair enough. So funnily enough all the Japs were there with the big long lenses and I had this little tiny camera and I got Johnny Cash just coming to swing round with his guitar I said that's my picture mate and he says don't worry about it I'll send it to your ass so it's in your mum's house somewhere no I see yeah Johnny Cash I'm sure he probably got paid off it but I took that picture are you heavy into like the post processing world Photoshop and Lightroom or that or is it no, just I'm on Lightroom like, I mean um, not really I, was, I, I don't not into Photoshop I don't even know how you work that I just just make it make one picture look amazing and mm. that's kind of it oh yeah like I've said that to mates of mine as well because being into photography myself you can stand there for an hour but all you need is one good picture to kind of satisfy yeah. that, that need in you do you find it like I find it's almost like therapy sometimes and I've never um, been to therapy but I find like I find the post process maybe a little bit more like that because I just zone out it's like a meditation for me but with the photography I don't get thing, obsessed with pixel because you just if you start you, there's a lot of factors when you stand on the stage and take a picture you've got lights you've got smoke You've got strobes. You've got people. You've got moving objects. You've got a lot of things that can fuck up a picture. And I always kick off with the lighting guys. I'm like, are you lot for real? When was the last time a light show had a number one record? <laughs> They're like, and we're two in a row and it's you, it's you. It's like, listen, it's, I get what I get. I mean, I've, seen, I've, I've switched my attention to the fans in the last seven well, months. I've that some proper mad out of it in the crowd. So that, yeah, because Liam pictures, you've got to be approved. And if he doesn't like the angle, he won't approve it. The rest of the band, they're okay. And it's, it's much more fun to take a picture of a crowd. Mm. Especially when there's pyros and they've got the shirts off and they're all drunk, they're in the moment. Yeah. Those South American mad things. Yeah, I, didn't, I, I, had a, I had a chest infection at that gig, so I didn't have a camera with me, so they were kind of left out. Any particular pictures you're really proud of? Yeah. There's one, uh, one at Finsley. Well, apart from the Ashcroft ones in America, the fan ones... There's one guy at Finsbury Park, he's got his shirt off, it's about 100 degrees, he's got a pair of shades on, he's got a pyro, green pyro in his hand and he's doing his selfie and he's, I had a, had a 70 to 300 adapted A, a, um, a series, A series and I got him, uh, I don't know, a quarter of a mile in the crowd. No way. Boom. That's kind of a cool one. I've seen some great pictures of Leem's two lads that, like, you know, sitting oh, on yeah. cases and stuff backstage. Well, I think. they kind of get in my way. It's like, can you get out of the way? I'll take <laughs> a picture. And they go, Uncle Paul. I went, get out of the way. So, yeah, so they kind of, Gene especially jumps in the middle. Lennon, because he's a model, he's like, don't take my picture. The guy, I'm, like, I'm not taking your picture. Get out of the way, model. You get out of the way. I'll take a picture of someone else. But if, you, if you're there in front of me, being a bell end, get here. What about the brother himself? Any pictures of him you're particularly proud of? I got, I got, I think I, I think I got a couple there from Malahide last year behind the screens and nearly got me electrocuted. Because you know the screens? Yeah. I had a cross tape meaning don't go down there or you'll die. I went, ah, whatever, what can possibly go wrong? So I had the camera pressed against the screens and you see him, it's like um, Venetian blinds really. So you, study, you, so you can it's see... It's like a shutter type thing. The shutter thing and he's in full regalia in the, in the full pose and I've, I showed it to Ashcroft and says, that's an amazing picture and he went 
Yeah. Liam, I don't, not, not, I'm not, I don't think Liam approved it or whatever. I'll keep it because that's, I'm not, I'm not getting rid of it. Is there a long term plan of maybe a book or an exhibition or anything like um, that? I wouldn't do a book because books, I've done a book. I don't know what before, didn't I? Don't want to do a book. It's a photography book, though. Yeah, but who? Tour life. Yeah, ow. Uh, probably do exhibition. I always Ex- remember that that Jill from Anovsky book from yeah. was there then. I went to the exhibition of that as well. It was Jesus like 15, I would. Pr- I prefer an exhibition and maybe sell prints that way and that kind of thing. I'd go to yeah. I'm not ready yet. Anyway, be a couple of years time. The one thing I always remember from that exhibition, which I thought was hilarious, was. She had that picture of the boys crossing the road in the state somewhere. I think the full band might have been in it, but what they did was they projected it onto the wall and yeah. you could basically try on parkas and kangle bucket hats and stuff and pose as if you were walking across the road. Uh, with yeah, them. yeah. They, and they, they take a Polaroid yeah, of it. They, I think. This was the late 90s, man. This was like, this was... Yeah, they go, they go, they go a bit over the top. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with all that stuff. Some great snaps. I actually want to hey, dig Liam, out that uh, Can I have your underpants from Malahide Castle? <laughs> uh, you what? No. Just look at the pictures. Look at the pictures. There's some for sale. There's some not for sale. I'm not that wanky about it. It's, it's whatever. If mm. you're in there, maybe an offer. If you're not, if you want to go and look at loads of people having fun, there you go. I definitely think there's something in that for you though, because like the vast collection. Even just looking at your Instagram, there's some amazing stuff. And like you're saying, the crowd shots alone, like there. I have a you, lot of pictures. I got like probably twenty six thousand something like that. But you could take twenty thousand pictures of Liam, and they might all look similar. But the pictures of the crowd will never be recaptured. Correct. That's the beauty They're of it. unique unique to that crowd and we'll see what happens tonight I mean I've got it's, it's all about I think the bigger the shows get the less access I get because there's more people side stage yeah uh, and I deliberately try not to get too close to the stage because the last thing I want is him going are you fucking doing on my stage <laughs> hey get off hey you hey that will be your second shout out ever it wasn't the first one in America when you got two lads over or something yeah I mean Charlie's diff- Char- Charlie will go on the stage but I, I, I kind of stay out of his way I kind of go around the perimeter if I can and if, if it depends if he's having a good gig or not he's like we're fucking on my stage for me who's Charlie now was Charlie Charlie Lightning did the oh, film the, the documentary yeah Char- Char- well, Charlie does that for a living with McCartney and stuff he, he'll go right on and I just kind of don't do it. I know photographers are supposed, supposed to go and get the picture but I want to take a picture of him for? what do I want to take a picture of him for I know what he looks like <laughs> Sick the, fa- the fans I can get a long range and, and behind wherever yeah and like we're saying, it's more unique. It's more of a rarity, and it's a time and place. Yeah, well, if, if loads of people have stood still, just been boring. I mean, that just makes for a boring picture. I, I look for certain. I look for pyro. I look for gangs of lads, usually with the shirts off. I'll have looked for people having an emotional breakdown. There's one the other night where a girl is at the front on the barrier in Prague. She's got a flat Eric, you know, the puppet. Yeah, the yellow Levi. And, and she, yeah, she looks like she's in a moment in time with her mouth open, yawning. And I was like, who brings Flat Eric to a gig? <laughs> well, anyway, that was cool. A few of them. DJing's your main bread and butter these days, and I know you DJed um, in the 80s. What kind of gear were you playing back then? Were you playing gigs, or was it just at home? No, I was out doing um, it was vinyl, wasn't it? So you was just playing in Manchester, bringing yeah, it's records. International 1, International 2. It's just, yeah. I just hated the music that all everyone played. It was just like, it was fucking shit. And what were you, were you playing mod stuff then, or what? No, I was probably in... Uh, well, eight, late eighties. Were, were you wearing eyeliner? No, <laughs> an oversized eyeliner. No, no. I'll leave that to the project. Um, no, uh, eighty six, eighty seven. It'd be like that Lars, Saturday end, that kind of stuff. Why is everyone was still playing? I don't know. Abba, especially around the Irish scene. You know, mm. it's like country and western. You were like going. Your old man was a country and western. He's DJ, a, yeah, he? he was. A, he was a, yeah, he was a country and western DJ. Was that where you got the bug originally? Do you think? Uh, no, I probably got the bug being pissed off with people playing shit music. To be fair, and I still do. Um, I've calmed down a lot recently I just really yeah DJing's not really I don't know everyone's a DJ yeah particularly now with the advent of laptop DJs you know? uh, yeah I mean I was in, I was in well, we were in Ibiza we did Ibiza Rocks a few years ago and someone had set me up in the Freddie Mercury room and I was like oh, Pikes the ho- it was there last it's October the, it's the holy grail in yeah Pikes mm. it's the, this is the holiest room I went whatever so anyway fill the room all great this other guy comes along he says I need to get my DJ on he says yeah where's his gear he had two USB sticks That's I was like one. turn it in mate oh they'll do it with one USB now where they'll interlink the two CDJs off one USB yeah. it's it's a head fuck because like, obviously I come from a background like I said with vinyl I you've got to, to physically do something and laptops break down and I don't trust USB sticks no I don't trust them either like, I've seen gigs spend hundreds of euros on these bulletproof USB sticks to go gigging with it's fucking mental but speaking of just of your dad being a country and western DJ, I love that story you've told before, the one about um, 
but I used to tape shit off the radio. And was it yeah, you yeah, we yeah. had selling them down the market? Yeah. So I, what I way did it work? I used to go with my, my bike. Now, to be fair to him, he's, <clears throat> he was, this was before graphic designers and he'd have his, he'd get the cassette boxes in bulk and he'd have these cards and he'd have gold pens. Like, you know, the, the uh, what's the name, the term for it? Uh, calli- calligraphy. calligraphy there you go he'd have it all handwritten out and he'd be like he's from Meath go down to America and send these to, 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 to this fella and the fella down the market turned into Mr Sifter it was the same oh, guy oh for real yeah okay. so that's the proper story Peter from Mr Sifter sold me songs when yeah. I was just yeah that was it. his stall in the market then he went to another part of Burnage and then he went to Fog Lane where he is now Weird. So he's been nice. intertwined in Gallagher history this is forever, early, pretty much. Early, That's mental. Early 80s. But stuff. these tapes that your dad was selling were songs taped off the radio. Yeah, is that well, correct? predominantly, yeah. Well, he, well, no, he had, well, that would be the top 40 ones, yeah. He, he, was, he was good at mixing. Record that, press that, pause, did it, and. Yeah, Tommy Gallagher, yeah. He's good at all that shit. But he had, he had vinyl as well. Big Tom doesn't play here anymore. He's gonna lock the barroom door. That kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Were you there that night, the infamous night in Dublin after the point in 95, was it, when he turned yeah. up with the news of the world? Were you there? Yeah. Have you had any kind of interaction since then, or is that kind of the last great No, one? I think somewhere along the grapevine, he wanted 20 grand off me to buy an house or something a few Fucking years hell. ago. I was like, Small house. Wrong, brother. No, I think he wanted a deposit. <laughs> I was like, whatever, mate. If I got 20 grand, I'm buying cameras. I'm not giving it to you two Sony G-Master lenses you get from the 20 grand these yeah. days speaking of the book that you wrote like, that's back in 90s were you on the Late Late Show back then oh what a Late Late Show that was I'm trying to because Late 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 Show your delighted now the two of her sons have graced the Late Late Show no we, we uh, I remember that day vividly we were coming through um, RT Studios and I noticed there was troops in the trees and I was like oh, fuck's going on here I thought it was just doing a TV show mm. it turns out the bill I was on was Jerry Adams <laughs> Martin McGuinness Christy Moore Myself, my mother, and Terry Christian. I met Jerry and Martin. Yeah, that 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 that's a historical lineup. And I met Jerry on the backstage. He's like, "Good luck with your book." I went, "Yeah, good luck with yours, Jerry. I see you later." <laughs> good luck with the peace process, Jerry. <laughs> and then off off to Lily Bordello's with, with me, Bally Fermat mates. They do had to hide because you remember they were giving out um, tonight's audience are going to receive LED light bulbs. There's one for everybody. On the yeah, end. and then from they from Bally Fermat. There's four of us, there's four bulbs. We can't bring them to Lily's. And this is the time in, in Dublin where you could hide stuff behind bus stops yeah. and you could go and pick them up at late, five hours later. And that's what they did. No Hold way. on, me, me LED light bulbs are behind the bus stop. And they go, you know, they have a lot of rake of pints and then go and find the LED bulbs later and put them in their funky houses. <laughs> yeah, true story. How did that book come about? Because obviously, was it... Was Terry Christian the actual writer, or did he both have a ghostwriter? Yeah, and Terry Christian brought the idea to you. No, um, where I'll, is Terry these I'll, days uh, anyway? If, Terry's a United fan. We we, we, we we don't bother. I think he called me out of the blue the other month. I berated him for whoever handed my mobile phone number over is getting battered. Kind of like, yeah. Um, but how did it come about? It anyway? came about it because I think there was a lot of shit going on in the newspapers, and I had been asked by a few people, "Do you want to do a book?" And I went, oh, ah. I think doing a book just put an end to some of these rumours and. How did Liam and anyway. Noel feel about it? Did they feel it was a betrayal uh, in any way or? Maybe I mean they yeah I don't, I don't know I mean they were all got they were given scripts and whatever and they didn't say yes they didn't say no so. In terms of the DJ gigs, do you still get people rocking up thinking it's going to be like an Oasis tribute yeah, set? Yeah. How does that go yeah, down? Yeah, I just I bring up well they, they should know by now I, I don't play Oasis at all well I just don't I never have so I'm not gonna start now no I do have a. <clears throat> I have a support DJ who's a mate of mine and he'll take care of all that shit okay so was it still I like I just want to play reggae really oh Northern Soul and shit mod class disco is there anyone out there I know you've said before that you don't really play anything of the modern era and there's nothing really in the last 20 years or whatever that's done it for you but is there anybody out there now that you're listening to not even in terms of DJing but that you're listening to personally that you're a fan of Um, yeah I, well, I do listen to new stuff I just, just find it all shit <laughs> the Black Keys are good. Uh, Temples have always liked They're good at singles. They're no good at records. Uh, Pond in Australia. Tommy Parler now and again. Kind of all that psyche stuff is okay. The rest, you throw a blanket on it. Father John Misty, I like. The Water Boys, new records, cool. There is little bits of stuff, but it's, it's not like you. You can't go pinpoint. I mean, Gangs of Youth from Australia were all right. You heard of them? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're like a, a, pop, a poppy kind of... They're good. Just what are the records you always come back to, both personally and from a DJ Oh, you always go back to... I always go back to the Waterboys. I mean, I've got 
20, he made, he made 22 records, I got 21 of them. Jesus. I met him in a lift in Valencia the other year. It's kind of funny, funny. Just, he's just don't meet heroes, but he's cool. Uh. He was cross-legged in the, in the foyer. And me and Liam were outside this hotel in Valencia after Benny Kassim. I just come out of the toilet and I looked to him. Is that Mike Scott? I went, it's fucking Mike Scott. So anyway, went to the toilet, come outside. Said to Liam, went, Mike Scott's in there. He went, there's Mike Scott. And I said, Mike Scott, the water boys. He went, all right, should we say hello to him? I went, come on then. Anyway, how does Liam Gallagher say hello to somebody? Does he just stroll up and say, all right? Yeah, he went, all right. And Mike Scott went, oh, I met you in 1995. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he proceeded to say that I'm a bigger fan of him than Indy. And then, yeah. But he put us on the guest list for that gig, but because, I, I don't know, there was a lot of drinking going on, and I missed the gig. And then, you know, you know them next mornings when you know you're in the same hotel as Mike Scott, mm. and you, but you didn't go to his gig because there was some family shit. So now you shit. want to avoid So you, now you're kind of going, right, I, don't, I, don't, I know his crew are going to be there. How do I breach this? So anyway, I get on the third floor, come down the lift, I'm thinking, I'll, I'll square it with him. Who pops in on the first floor? Mike Scott, I'm like, <laughs> Mike, about last night, don't worry about it, these things happen, da, 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 da. and then he proceeded to talk to me for two hours, and then gave me a USB stick of soul music that he deliberately put on for Liam to listen to, give that to your brother, he might find some inspiration. <laughs> you pocketed it. No, 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 I didn't, I didn't, I explained to Liam, I said, listen, I've got a USB stick here, Mike Scott made you some music, made you a mixed and he's gone, uh, yeah, you keep hold of that because I'll lose it. <laughs> and I've still not listened to it yet, but I will. I think I might do a Boogaloo radio show and dedicate it to the music, the, the DJing of Mike Scott. How about that? That'd be funky. Mike Scott's Liam Gallagher mixtape. There, there you go. go I mean, man. we can talk about. I'm figuring Curtis Mayfield's on it, and but it, it was it was a funky, expensive sand disc. It was like okay. a it was a fifty quid stick. Okay. It, it wasn't no cheap fucking it was like two, one, two ninety nine. DJs rock up to no, no, no. Them. This, this, this was one of them ones. You know, them, you know, like them old Samsung ones that used to be. They like have triangles that blend into. I don't know what they call it. Geomet symmetrical, kind of shiny black. And I was like, I remember I was in an airport one day afterwards, and I was like going, "Let me check the price of that stick. I bet that's a funky stick. And I think it's about a hundred quid. That's a hundred quid stick, Mike Scott. Okay. It wasn't Top cheap. Man. Still getting them hold of the moon royalties, man. Do you have a favorite Oasis record? Well, when uh, I say track, I oh yeah, no, um, um, no, um, I used to be, it used to be fade away, and stay young. It's kind of the old stuff, but I do, I do, I do like his new. He's got some new ones. He's got a track called Once, which is a brilliant I love song. That. I mean, so that plays scary. out over the end of the documentary. Yeah, that, people are so obsessed with that online on Reddit. They're yeah, ripping the DVD uh, titles be, and putting it up. That is going to be well. You hope you'd hope it'd be a big song, but you could put out a masterpiece these days and. Nobody buy it. Mm. It's Particularly the day and age because music is so it, disposable now. Well, it, uh, art should never be for free. It's, it's like people. It's like photography. You're taking a picture. Two minutes later, someone stole it <laughs> and put it on their thing. And I, I'm sick of chasing ten year olds around Instagram going, "Oi, that's my picture. <laughs> Credit." Or you get head butted. <laughs> yeah. Where they're going? Oh, I didn't know. Well, you didn't fuck. Well, you didn't fucking take it yourself, did you? Yeah. And it's like you, you become the headmaster going. The fuck? Why am I chasing ten year olds? And then if you scream at them, they screenshot what you've said and fuck it. Yeah. You can't win. I know, I get you. I Little get you. bastards. I've heard you talk in the past, you mentioned the international one and two there earlier, like when you were early DJing. I've heard you talk about seeing the roses and stuff back then. Seeing the roses, yeah. And the Lars. Uh, you gave a stunning critique once about Ian Brown's voice back then that he, he couldn't sing then and he can't sing now. Well he can't sing now. I mean I mean as nice as the guy is, he just I mean he's made he's done very very well for his limited ability. And that's just if you're going to be a critique of singing, uh -huh. funny enough, we see we met Manny the other night in Prague, and he, yeah, Manny's Manny's a good bass player. He, he good. I mean, the Roses were more than his voice. It was more the attitude, the timing, the songs, the playing the squire, the drumming of Rennie, the bass player Manny. So it was a perfect storm. Yeah, they had all, all the bits, and they could accommodate Ian's monotone voice what do you think then has given him such longevity in his career because like he's had a, a mildly successful solo career to an extent yeah. peaks and troughs like he started really well first two albums were great dropped off a little bit got back with the roses and all that but people still idolise him because I think it's because he's got such that iconic look like, yeah exactly I mean if, if you had a hit if you were big in the 80s and 90s as the lack of music uh, coming out now has shown that you will 
you'll always pack shows because people want nostalgia. Mm. Did you go see the Roses reunion tour? Uh, I think I went. I went to the Heat and Park thing. I went the very first one at Heaton Park and I was so yeah, disappointed I think, with it. I thought I think it was terrible. I, I think I seen. I went. Well, I can't remember. I think was it the Saturday night? I went. I went to one of them. I went to one of them. <laughs> and that was it. Didn't do two. No, I did one. Did you listen to any of the new music they put out? The two tracks. Uh, no, it's disgraceful. I mean, yeah, you, you can't. Yes, no, it's not. I kind of find it weird as well. There's so much ambiguity now about where it lies now. Like, obviously, they're not together anymore. Was there another falling out? Like, you've seen the... Ian had a video out for his latest solo track, and he's firing a pink strat into a lake, and everyone's like, oh, he's falling out with John Squire well, again. I, 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 I don't think they ever got on. I think none of them ever... I think Manny was the peacekeeper. I think it's... I mean, reading between the lines, it's to do with Rennie and, and Ian. That's the kind of... What you make of Sean Ryder and the Mondays still on the go? Um, Alan McGee, I think, looks after them. Yeah, well, got bills to pay. Got kids, you know, got tax him. bills and all kinds of shit. And that the tax man doesn't go away once you get older. Once you've had a hit record, and you've, you know, they're like, oh, we want our money. You know, we want to ship it offshore, and you know, and buy a sherry and stuff. And uh, you know, we put you to jail because we're the Tories, and that's what we do. Riders got them shiny teeth these days to keep up. Oh <laughs> <as well. laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, every, everyone, everyone's got got to work. You got to work till you say seventy five, is it, or eighty now? What we were just saying about Ian Brown's voice there. Does it piss you off when people kind of speak about Liam in that regard sometimes? Well, they don't understand me, Liam. Liam sings in a totally different uh, technique and key to Ian Brown, where he's he's more. There's a lot more power in Liam's voice than in most voices. Now, if you throw in uh, the, the, the thing he's got wrong with his, his thyroid, if you throw in that Hashimoto's, which makes your voice go like more croakier, it's because of it's, it's because of the tablets he's on. And there's nothing you can do about that. That's just you can reverse it, but it takes time. So he's get he's got he's got his diet right. He's got his running right. Obviously, you've got to have a pint again now and again. He don't he's curved down and everything. You know. He's, it is what it is, and he's 46. But you, you have a lot of people, and I will slag them off, Americans, <laughs> Americans, American fuckers, who are like, oh, he doesn't sound like he sounded in 1995. Well, no, because he was fucking a kid. They have no, you know, concept, and it's predominantly Americans. There's a theory online that you may be harboring a 90s Liam-esque voice somewhere Me? in you. Yeah, no, I've no, seen no. that discussed. It no. said, imagine if Paul Gallagher was to suddenly be caught on camera on Instagram singing a track and he sounded no. like Liam in 95 no I'll be, I'll be more singing I'll be more I sound like Mick Hucknall in 1989 it was either your book or somebody else's account when they spoke about Liam as a teenager and how he always had that star quality and he was always destined to be a star yeah without the way it played out with Oasis and all do you think that he would have found his way yeah. into celebrity yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. well he'd have, he'd have been in a band definitely whether, they knew, whether they'd been as big and, I mean who's to say everyone has Noel up as a genius but Without Liam selling the songs, I mean, would you ever hear of his songs? Can you still remember the first I time mean, you heard the likes of Live Forever and stuff like that? Yeah, but I mean, could you see Noel like Damien Rice sitting on his fucking stool wailing, oh, I'm in so much pain. <laughs> you can, it, 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 it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. So you, you, need, you needed the vehicle. They needed each other. When was the first time you heard the likes of Live Forever and that? Was it live when you, went, when you no, were forced into seeing them or in, a, in a, re, a rehearsal room? They had a rehearsal room the on boardwalk. the boardwalk. Yeah. I used to go down, obviously, because, yeah. Like a tiny room. Like, they'd be the band, and then they'd be like two or three people. And yeah. Is there any thoughts on? I remember I just kind of sped read through. Tony McCarroll maintains that Noel didn't have the likes of Live Forever and all the back catalogue until he joined Oasis. Whereas the um, common theory is that he had them beforehand. No, he didn't have them before because he would have heard them. It's like um, no, he just, he got into his he just got into a purple patch and he he, he written them songs. He didn't write them for himself. He written them with four oasis mm -hmm. he didn't write them to suddenly be this fucking I don't know solo star with all these harmonies stuff, and he did Liam a favour but he written them for that band so that's and was there a great degree of help there from the real people that band that were knocking around not really I see, I mean, again it's another misconception yeah the real people supported the Inspirals that's how they met Noel and they went over to Bootle to do some demos recording anyone would think the real people were the Beatles and they fucking like, you know, they own Oasis. It wasn't like that. They're just messing around the studio. You kind of strike me from what I've seen you talk about before is that you weren't enthused with that whole Manchester scene to a certain extent with the roses mm. and that. No, that, I mean, I, I mean, the, the, it was different. I mean, Manchester, Manchester was all ecstasy, wasn't it? Drugs, Hacienda. 
didn't serve Guinness or pints. What's the fucking So what point? were you doing when everybody was I off mean, their head down the Hacienda? Oh, I, probably, I was probably in an Irish bar getting fucking leathered on Guinness. You used to go to the Hacienda, it's like, you get searched and you get all this bullshit and all they sell was water. Who the fuck wants to go out and have a pint of water? Oh yeah, but you have an E, get off your head and see fucking Spider-Man. No, I wanted a pint. So I didn't... Fuck that. You were a hardcore mod growing up, of course, and I've, I've seen you say before that like you idolised Weller from both a musical and well, yeah. a style point of view. Now, I'm sure... Yeah, given, I'm, I'm, I've met him a few times. So yeah. I'm going to say family links. Is he as much of an anarchy old bollocks as Noel makes out that he uh, is? I remember... The, well, I can, I can tell you the first time I met him, and you should never meet your heroes, is, is the thing. So I think uh, it was at this... It was somewhere in London. It was 94. And I remember him coming up to me after a show and going, you got any cigs? And I went... Play yeah. Cool. Anyway, get him out then, you northern monkey. I went, eh? Are you talking to me? I was like, I think I had Emerson Warner. I said, there you go, mate. Never meet your heroes. I mean, to be fair, he's, he's all right, but his real name's not Paul, is it? He's living a lie. His name's John. Like so, his dad, his dad's his yeah, dad I know, I know. You've been, fa- you've been faking it for years, mate. You've been conning me out of money. Your name is John Weller. He's, 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 he's all right, Weller. I mean, to be fair to him, every time I've always seen him, he's always let on. He's like, all right, mate, all right, Paul, and all that kind of stuff. So he's not called me a wanker, so he's all right. He's not called you a northern monkey anymore. No, like no, no, he's not called me that since. He probably can't remember. He's probably off his tits, but... Someone yeah. I know that Weller hates, and this is from another Noel quote as well, is Bono. Where do you stand on the great Bono debate as every, Bono. every Irish person has an opinion? What's yours? Um, bongo. Uh, well, musically, I think they were all right until... What was the fucking... What's the album? Octone Baby? Yeah. And after that, they were fucking rubbish. I think they were a singles band. There wasn't an album band. They, I think they, the Edge still plays the same riff he's played since 19-fucking-64. I, I, I can't be doing with the preaching, really. Joshua Tree is still a great album. Yeah, uh, I think there's a few singles. I think they had their little period up to about 87, 88. And they're doing what every other band has done ever since. It's just like the Stones did. Mm. They had a little period... And then they just play greatest hits all the way through, and then they'll throw out the odd little fucking thing. The little but peep. It, it is actually the preaching that I can't fucking do. You know, I, I never met him. What is he, five foot five with his little Cuban heels? You should just get your money out now. It's like, fuck you. You and Geldof can fuck off. The <laughs> pair he is, fuck off. <laughs> Back in the 90s when you were an a and or a creation, like how did that job come about? Just from being in the circle and knocking around with McGee? Yeah, well, I've always, I always looked at bands in it. And, um, it's just a black half. I think it was just a laugh. And were they the hedonistic days of creation or had McGee gone to rehab? Well, no, them? I was scouting in, in Manchester. I shared an office with Northern Uprose manager and McGee. I was getting shit in Manchester as well. So you imagine Oasis just blew up and there's a lot of jealous people around. And uh, yeah, McGee just said, listen, I'll get you to London fucking and that's it I never, never went back again I was like stay there it's a massive misconception as well that Oasis were signed to creation but it was actually Sony they were signed yeah. to wasn't it it, it think, was just cooler that, to be on an indie well that was of. the way the, the deal went through I mean McGee did generally see them and he wanted to sign them to creation because the way the Sony deal was structured Sony obviously the big international bully they'd have them but licensed back to creation because it's an indie thing cooler thing to do and that's, yeah I mean Oasis would have, would have been dropped on a major mm. they would have been lost in the machine so it was better the way it works out. How the fuck did you end up working for Sky Sports? That's a fucking other mad one. Uh, I was friends with uh, a band called South, who were also friends with another guy, what's his fucking name, Des, who managed South, and then he was connected to another band. He was connected to a guy called Harry Pratt, who was mates with Death in Vegas, and Harry Pratt used to work for the Daily Star, and anyway, he called me one day, he says, you want to work at Sky Sports? He goes, an online writer. I says, really? Oh, anyway, did that for a year. I met more, there is more cunts in that building, in Sky Sports, than I met in the entire music business. <laughs> more egos, and plus it took me nearly two hours to get there every day. Fuck Sky. Speaking of creation of McGee, he's doing a fine line in uh, stage talks these days. He's in doing yeah, a, yeah, a he's talking doing circle. That. Yeah, that's something him. you could get into as well, make a few quid, man. Well, no, I mean, I know the guy's doing it with Rob. I mean, that's, yeah, no. I, I'm, I'm doing a thing on the Boogaloo Radio, which Jerry's fellow owns it. He's from uh, Sligo. He's asked me a few times. He says, you want to do a radio show? And why don't you ask me on the eight months I've just had off? off? Why are you asking me now when I'm going fucking on tour? But no, I did it the other day. I mean, it was all right. But well, there's this talk of them making a film now based on the book, the creation stories. There. Yeah. And I've seen, like, talking the press that they're looking for somebody to play a young Liam. 
How have either of his two young lads not been tapped when they're the head? Well, they of were. Both of them were asked, but both of them said no. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm in that movie. Oh, for real, yeah? Yeah, they asked, well, they offered me two cameos. The first one that I couldn't do was uh, King Tut's Wow Wow Hut, and I had to say Oasis is shit. I said, I, couldn't, I can't do that. Sacrilege. That's sacrilege. And the second one, I'm play, uh, apparently, I'm playing Pub Landlord, 1983, and I've got to take money out off McGee and not give it him back. This reminds me of Human Traffic when Carl Cox plays the, the club that promoter. Ca- that kind of thing. Because apparently McGee sold the line that it's going to be a busy gig and you know there's no one here and fucking... And, I, and I'm the pub landlord going, yeah, where's my hire fee? And he's going, he's slipping me and I'm going, give me the fucking money. And I get the money off him and then someone else wants the money back and I'm like, you're not getting the fucking money. So yeah, apparently I'm, I'm I, playing him. I can understand why Lennon would turn it down, but like Gene is kind of at a bit of a loose end. He's, did, did he get fucked out of school or something? I saw him um, in, in the Times last week. Apparently so, but um, well, he's got ADHD and he's so hyperactive kids. I don't know. So, some some of these some of these schools in London just want the money. They don't want to do te- they don't want to do teaching. It's basically here's a posh school. Give us loads of money. Do what you want. I mean, it's impossible to get kicked out of that school. How how he managed it, I'll never know. <laughs> He's a Gallagher. Yeah. <laughs> Any musicality in either of them? I know Gene. Yeah, kind no, of playing Gene, in the band. Gene, Gene's cool. I remember, I've, I've got this like, not got this. I've got a group of friends who are Irish trad musicians, and we're looking at doing something. So we. we we were going a while in one week, but we needed a quick rehearsal. There was a, there was a, dr- dr- the drummers wasn't available, and I said to Gene, I said, "You can play the drums." He went, "Yeah." I said, "Kill, pick you up at half seven. We've got to wax in." He went, yeah, "We'd have to bring us the cymbals." And he comes out of his bedroom with cymbals still built in on the stands. I went, "Oh yeah, you got all fucking cases." He went, "No." I went, right, well, "Whatever." Into the car, down the rehearsal room, three or four mad paddies, about sixty years of age, looking at him, and Gene's going. Go on then, what do you want? <laughs> I just said, just keep telling you, cool. He's there. And then he starts fucking giving it away. Yeah, Keith Moon. Giving it to Rennie. Keith Moon. Ch- chill out. No, he's good. He played drums. He can play guitar. He's a talented kid, Gene. I believe you were the one who convinced Andy Bell to join Oasis. Is that true? I did, yeah. I, I've got a track record in converting guitarists into bass players. How did that come about? They probably just hate me now. Um, I think they were looking, Oasis were looking, Gwigsy had left. What's Gwigs up to these days? I haven't seen him. He lives, he, doesn't, he lives about three miles from me, but I've never seen him. Yeah, they were looking for a bass player. They tried out some bass players. I happened to be in Liam's house one night. And I said, why don't you try Andy Bell from Hurricane Number 1? And Liam's like, oh, I don't know what I'm I said, listen, he can play every instrument. He can play the guitar. He can play the piano. And I'm sure he can play the bass. And then the next day, that, that, that must have happened quick, because the next day I went into creation... And Andy came in and he went, oh, thanks, man. I says, what for? He goes, I'm in Oasis. <laughs> I went, oh, no, there you go. Well done. Where's me, where's me fucking finder's fee? They already had Gem at this stage because I think Bonehead had left at this yeah, stage already. Yeah, Gem went in and see the guitarist, yeah. Was there ever any kind of, I don't know, you weren't really in the eye of the storm with this, but this is something I've often wondered, that when Liam and the boys formed BDI, Gem was still playing with Noel because he did that Teenage Cancer Trust gig. Was there ever kind of any animosity on, like, on Liam's side for Gem still fraternising and playing with Noel? No, no. I mean, well, when BDI ended, it, it, that's it. All bets are off, innit? People go where they go. So, but this was before because he was still in BDI. He was playing like a teenage cancer trust. Um, and well, stuff. I, not not that not that I noticed that. I didn't notice any animosity. So, don't know. I was surprised I to learn as well that like when you're obviously doing your DJ gigs after the stuff, a lot of the time you travel separately. Like I saw you talking about a US tour thing that you did once, and you book a lot yeah, of the gigs yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought that would come under the one umbrella. Mm, no, I mean only yeah. Now it comes under the one umbrella, but no, not before. Because BDI was different. It's, was the individuals where this band is more like a session band. So Liam's just, Liam's the the main man here. So yeah, he, he can get away with more. But no, when it's all a big bigger thing, it's like uh-huh. basically fuck off. Well, yeah, no, you have to you have to do the hard graft, and now America's the hard place to. Somewhere else was a hard graft. Too was big. That, was that fateful night in Paris? You stuck around, and were you, was it you playing backstage or were you playing in a tent? No, I was when doing. When the band broke up yeah, and announced that they no, weren't playing backstage. I was back doing in. an after show for the, the actual festival. I don't, I don't know how that come about, but yeah, yeah, the French, the French, yeah, they were, they, yeah, they were getting excited. You fucking Gallagher's, you fucking record party. Ooh, you, you, you. I was like, fuck off, mate. Do one, and I just played cheap, but they wouldn't pay me till about six a.m. Just. We are holding your fee. Fuck you. I got paid in the end. So, uh. Did you head back to London or did you go? Link no, up I got. I, I had the option to go to Milan with the lads on a plane. 
And I said, I can't do that, can I? I've got to stay here. I mean, I can't, you know, you can't just all fuck off. Fuck it, I'll be executed. No, so, no, I, st- I, 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 was, I had a French girlfriend back then, so it was easy for me to stay in France. How many times a day or a week are you asked about a reunion? Um, I think most people have got used to it's not happening, so. Yeah, the last ever Irish gig was 10 years yesterday, Slain. Yeah, Slain, yeah. Slain, 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 Slain was, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you a story about Slain. While we're in Cork, we can talk about this. I'd previously met Stephen Ireland, who's from Cork, mm-hmm. and uh, he said, oh, it'd be nice to go to Slain. All right, kill. Cool. So he drove over in his posh fucking Bentley car, because so we, we were on, so I said, we're coming over the night before, you go to Slain in your car, there's your car park pass, park it up, you'll be fine. Anyway, I get a Stephen Island nearly crying on the phone. They won't let me in. So what do you mean he won't let you in? They says I, I refuse to play for my country, so they're not going to let me in. All right, listen, mate, it'll all be sorted. As I go up in a fucking buggy and say, you're all right. He doesn't want to play for Ireland, but you got to let him in. So yeah, we got him in, and then and we had a party that night after, and I don't think I've seen him since. Yeah, yeah, he did. He was going to cry because they wouldn't let him in. I personally, as a fan, hope it never happens a reunion never happens and it's a strange thing for someone to say as a fan like at the start of as it was Liam even admits himself that it was on the slide for a couple of albums the records weren't doing as well there was I found maybe two to three tracks per album that were golden and I'd go back to still but I kind of feel like that the glory days were obviously the 90s and like everybody gives Be Here Now I fucking love Be Here Now yeah, well yeah I mean he, he plays it he plays it on the on the, the track Be Here Now he plays it on the tour so that was my favourite track off the album yeah, as well it used to be the intro to the Be Here Now tour good, as well it's a, it's a good song it's a banger I think, I think 10 years yeah it's, it's, I mean there was a time maybe 2011 12 where it could have been something could have been sorted out the family shit but nah it's too it's too far gone and plus Liam's back on top now so why why would he why would he want to do it but he still admits at the end of the documentary oh yeah I mean, I mean, says, I mean, he misses him listen, you know? no it's big business do I, do I generate big money this and Noel fucking, loves money this is fucking big yeah Noel is big money he lives in a big house he generates big business only sh- someone stupid would go I mean if the, I don't even think the money's been offered so all these people his fans that want it but I think the promoters have gone it's not going to happen so if it was to happen which incarnation do you think it should be do, should Bonehead be in the mix would he want to be in the mix um, or would it be Gem and Andy as it was last left no I think that's something you never see discussed amongst fans they never really uh, talk about what well, yeah, really, not. Uh, I, they just I want per- Liam and Noel together well personally I'd, I'd have Bonehead in it because I think he's a better rhythm guitarist than most of them yeah Noel would want Gem it'd, it'd, it'd be more it'd be like chess you know they'd be like uh, I'll have this one you have this one I'll have this one <laughs> I'll have him it's like oh what we left with that's why it's not going to happen there'll be too much for arguing in the As You Were documentary there's a great line and I'm not sure if it's attributed to you or it's Bonehead that says it that says kids want to be Liam they don't want to be Noel why is that? because he's, he's, he's well it's true if you look around I mean you don't see many Noels I don't see anyone dressed like Noel I don't see many Pauls either there's loads of Liams fucking everywhere I think there's in Italy there's 300 Oasis tribute bands so there's 300 Liams. I think Liam has that same effect oh. that we spoke about Ian Brown earlier. He's got that iconic thing about him. Yeah, he's got he's got he's got the aura. Everybody wants to just want to be him. I don't I don't fucking I mean I wouldn't want to be him, but man, again I'm not you know. You'd be hard pressed to name a more iconic frontman of the last 25, 30 years. Yeah, I mean he, even, even John Lydon, we only got that one record, and it's, nobody wanted to be John Lydon, did they? Nobody wanted to be Roger Daltrey. Nobody wanted to be Ray Davis. He's kind, of, he's kind of, you know, he's, he's, probably, he's probably up there with Freddie Mercury in the iconic I want to be. Mm. But again, you don't see many Freddie Mercury look like around there. Well, maybe in the 80s when moustaches were big. Uh, Another interesting point in that documentary was the, the last week in Parma when yourself, himself and Bonehead fucked oh, up. Yeah. What went on that week? A lot of drinking uh, or what? Yeah. Did, did he really just call you and say, get over to my house and you came with an overnight well, bag and you yeah, went away yeah. for a week? Yeah, well, yeah, that's how I kind of, I mean, I was out getting vegetables. I mean, I was juicing at the time and I was behaving myself. Yeah, I had the call the night before and I thought, yeah, he's gone, drunk, gone to bed. So I had to get my phone fixed as well at the same time. So my screen had broke on, I don't know what iPhone it was, a four or a five. Uh-huh. So I thought, right, this would be a good time. I get some vegetables, put the phone and get it fixed and they give me a shit Nokia thing back. And anyway, the phone starts going, yeah, can you phone, yeah, yeah. I went, fucking, ah. <laughs> so I had to go back to the shop. I said, paid for the phone. I said, give me phone back. He went, I not took you to bars. I said, give it here, I need it. <laughs> There's the money, you're back in a week. Anyway, got home, dropped the veg off. Picked up the JD, picked up the fags. He goes, bring your iPad. I went, oh, cool, iPad. 
just book a private jet. And on he the says uh, he's getting in touch with the travel. We got a travel agent thing. Get in touch with the travel agent. All right, cool. Right, so I've got travel one. agent for rich people. I'm yeah, like, well, uh, private jet. So um, yeah, one hand going. Uh, where can we go? And she's like, well, it was can. There was this and that. Then I think she said, oh, there's a ten o'clock flight to Palmer. There's a, that pictures on the internet where I've got a red rab coat on and I'm kind of bleary eyed getting on a jet and he's like. <laughs> <laughs> and he's wild yeah, no, that, that's definitely on the internet somewhere it's like a were you worried that he was on the verge of a breakdown at the time almost nah, nah, nah he's just got to get away and then uh, and then kind of you wake up in Palmer and you go or I think with Dale we were in you wake up going right what, what happens now he's like oh, it's alright Bonehead's coming <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake yeah so I had a, a week on the piss and then when you got back was like I think yeah I think a few pennies dropped and this I don't know whatever was going on sorted out yeah Liam's new album obviously you're very close with Liam these days mm. I'm sure I've seen you at I've not Abbey heard Road. the record not all of it I've seen you at, at Abbey Road and stuff though but would you give your critique or your uh, a producer kind of stance on something um, if you thought it wasn't no, working I mean, no if he asked me what do I think and I tell him the truth well I'm not going to go oh I think you should change that song and put this song in because he'd be like you know what I think he has enough troubles trying to with his record company and agents and everyone managers and everyone else who's got a, and he's probably just fucking sick of fielding the same fucking question so I just go yeah it's cool or it's not cool I mean I, I, I wouldn't say probably I wouldn't probably say to him oh I didn't like that song I probably wouldn't say anything what's the point that's not going to get you anywhere particularly get... when your brother's Liam Gallagher <laughs> yeah what do you mean all that song <laughs> it's like what's the point I don't like it it's my opinion I don't have to play it do I so last question Mr G a man who's uh, been surrounded by music his entire life how would you like to go out what song would you want played at your funeral Uh won't be anything by Oasis. I didn't think it would. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll probably have uh, a song called One by Not You Two either. Uh, Mike Scott, the Water Boys. Probably, yeah, he's got millions of songs. There's loads of them. Fucking, that's, I couldn't even put my finger on one of them. because there's. Many. I'll probably play Trumpets by Water Boys. It's like an 80s song. Maybe you should have a route through that USB. Yeah, no, he's going to have soul in there. No, I've got all these records. I mean, I don't know. Town call my yeah no I'm sick of being the town I'll be have to play that again yeah I've got to play the same songs and I'm on the Liam thing but he's trying to make, he's trying to interfere a few times who has Liam has? yeah I think I think you need to change this I mean you're not you're not the DJ mate oh wait mate, are you choosing the music yeah, that plays before he comes out he, he, well yeah we we kind of debate he'll go stick this in and I'll say it doesn't work we'll try it once and it'll fucking people be on the mobile phones and it doesn't work mate you let me DJ I don't get I don't tell you to sing Abba I'm fucking all cool. It's, it is what it is. It's all about getting the crowd ready for the show. It's not about what you think is great in while well, you're having fucking dinner. It's what it works. So, there you go.